I was born the oldest of seven children in a sweet Catholic family. We had lots of noise and commotion and laughter and tears and fighting and, and joy, all those things that go on with a family, nine people living under the same roof, so you can imagine. Parents loved each other. I felt secure and loved in my home. We had a happy childhood. Not perfect, but happy. So uh, we had great expectations for ourselves when we married, you know, just like all young people do. We were going to be successful financially. We were going to have a family. We were going to be happy and life was going to be good. Uh, our children were involved in sports and they were good athletes. And certainly I was one of the soccer moms and the swim team mom and the brownie cookie mom and, you know, you get the picture. We went to church on Sundays. We had them all lined up in, a, in the pew, all in a row, and we just really looked like the all-American family. So I had my first drink when I was 13, and um, I stole liquor from my parents' liquor cabinet, climbed outside my window at night, and drank in the bushes at the end of the driveway. And from the first time I drank, I loved what alcohol did for me. I went to high school here in the county, and it was uh, our first uh, dance. Uh, it was a winter formal, I believe. Uh, so it was essentially my first date. And uh, I went with a, a boy that served. <laughs> he had long hair, he drove a VW bus, and my parents hated that. <laughs> and um, that made him even more attractive. <laughs> so we went to this dance, and he was really cute, and I was really shy. And, one thing led to another, and he pulled out this cocaine. And I really didn't want to do it, I mean, that's the truth. I was terrified, actually. I knew that it wasn't right, and I didn't want to do this. I was completely in over my head, but he was really cute. I just, I really wanted him to like me more than I wanted to be right with myself. So I did the cocaine. And that decision changed and altered the course of my life. From that point forward, we engaged in a relationship around cocaine and alcohol, using whenever we could. And in, in one year, I went from, you know, regular life at, at school. Uh, I was a national swimmer, you know, good home life, great grades, excellent education. In one year, I lost everything. I couldn't keep my swimming up. I lost my grades. My friends changed. I wasn't coming home anymore. My parents tried everything to help me manage me, control me, contain me. They tried everything. You named it, they did it. They sent me to therapy, psychiatry. They tried everything to, to help me, including putting me in three treatment centers by the time I was 18. And every center they put me in, they kidnapped me and take me to treatment. I would proceed to escape. They, they tried one more time to kidnap me and put me in treatment in a place in Idaho. They drove me from here, from Marin County, to Idaho nonstop left me in a wilderness program, which I proceeded to escape. It took me a while to figure out how to get from Idaho back to California, but I did. And I came to my parents' house here in Marin, and I knocked on their door, and my mom came to the door, and she said, Christina, I'm so happy to see you. And you are not welcome in my home or in my life until you're living a life of recovery. And if I never see you alive again, I want you to know how much you're loved. And she closed the door. So you're saying to yourself, I couldn't do that. I can't imagine doing that to my child. Well, it didn't happen easily for me. It didn't happen overnight. I was doing everything right. You know, I was doing things the way I was raised. You know, we had family dinners at night. We went to the swim meets the soccer games, the baseball games. I knew my children's friends. I drove the carpool. I made cookies when they came home from school. I mean, what is going on here? This is so bewildering. But I, I certainly had to acknowledge that something was amiss. I mean, there's so much shame in that. So when we took her to the first treatment center, they recommended there that I try Al-Anon. So for those of you who don't know, Al-Anon is a support group for people who love alcoholics. I found my way to my first meeting. So I sat down and started listening to people share and these tears, these tears just kept coming. 
They were flowing from where I had no idea. I didn't feel anything. It was like I was dead inside. Okay, so I leave this meeting and I'm thinking, oh, I'm so glad those people have some place to go. But that's not for me. But of course, I finally did make my way back to Al Anon. And I started going three and four meetings a week. I started finding my voice again, finding courage to fight for my daughter to go to treatment. So it's so ironic to me that through my daughter's addiction, I started finding my own life again. When that call came at 3 a.m. that she had run away in the worst snowstorm in 50 years, with nothing but her clothes that she had on her back, and, and here she runs away. But I got it at that moment. I just got it. I said, you know what? I have no power over my child. I have no power over her choices. The only choices I have power over are my own. So when she came to the door that day, it didn't seem like I was turning her away. That's not how it felt to me. It felt like, okay, Christina, you're 18 years old now. I, I'm powerless over what you choose to do with your life, but I have my own to consider, and I have three other children and a husband to take care of and manage that life, and it, I can't do it with your drama that you bring into our house. So you'll need to make your own way, and treatment will always be available. So when my mom, after my mom closed the door on me, I, I descended into the depths of addiction there all the while drinking and using whatever substance I could, anything from cocaine, methamphetamine, and anything in between, ecstasy, mushrooms, acid, you name it, I've tried it. I could not picture my life without drugs and alcohol. I used to think about what my mom said, uh, that treatment was always available, and I'd think about getting sober, like maybe I should take her up on that because this sucks. But um, it was a very fleeting thought. Because what followed next was the realization that I would somehow have to live my life without substance and I could not fathom it. I also could not understand how I would ever recover from the terrible things that I'd done to myself and other people. And it was probably easier for me just to die than it was to get better. I was arrested and I was put in a homeless shelter and it was on the floor of the homeless shelter that I had my realization I could disappear off the face of this earth and nobody would know. The last thought I remember having before I closed my eyes to die was how sad my mom will be that it ended this way. Well, we'd had many starts and stops along the way, so it's not like you put total faith in what an addict says to you. But uh, I was thrilled that she had made this choice and hopefully it would work this time. So I said, you know, Christina, that's great. I'll call the treatment center. I'll make sure they have a bed for you. You can find your way there and we're going on vacation. We had actually had one planned and we needed the rest and uh, so we no longer would change all the family plans to accommodate Christina and her addiction or her recovery even. So I lived in a van and I went to 12-step uh, meetings uh, two, three, four times a day and I tried to slowly put my life back together. Coming back from homelessness is profoundly challenging. I heard no more than I heard anything else. No, you can't work here. No, we don't want you here. No, you can't swim here. No, you can't park your van here. Go away. It was in that time of my life that I, I decided to hear no as an opportunity and not an end. I began to make peace with my family. After nine months of sobriety, I had dinner with my, with my family. There came a time in my recovery that I had a lot of shame about the things that I had done in my life. I made a list, and my list was this. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to have a business one day that helps people. I'm going to finish school. I'm going to go to college. And I'm going to go back to swimming. Like, why not? Hey, Mom, we're, we're actually going to write a book. <laughs> I don't know this yet, but we're going to write a book. <laughs> and I, I had this pit in my stomach. I thought, oh, great. Here we go. Because it's not the adversity that comes our way, but what we do with it that counts. That's what defines us. This is what I've learned. If I can be brave enough to live a transparent life, tell the truth about who I am with light and dark parts, then there's absolutely nothing that I cannot do. I am an all-American athlete, and I am an all-American drug addict. And the beauty is I can be all these things and be defined by none. I think the thing I'm most proud of, though, is to be my mom's daughter.